Court received a note from the foreperson dated the 29th of February 2024 at 11.50 a.m. And the note reads, Your Honor, can we please receive clarification as to the verbiage of count three? Specifically, in order to constitute tampering, that's in quotes, does the defendant need to have physically altered, destroyed, concealed, or removed an item or thing, i.e., in quotes, physical contact? The second question. Further, the information never mentions the term accessory or accessorial liability. Following the juror instructions would lead one to believe having accessorial liability is enough to prove a defendant guilty of tampering with physical evidence. Is that the case, or is the section titled accessorial liability from page 44 of the jury instructions misleading? Well, of course, the jury would not know what 53A-8A means. So the court will have to explain. First, they would have to have, hopefully the jury has a copy of the information. Yes. Is there just one copy or are there six copies? Just one. So the court would first direct them to the information and explain that in counts three and five, well, the court will read those counts again and indicate 53A-8A means accessorial liability or as an accessory. Now, concerning the second question, or rather the first question, can we please receive clarification as to the verbiage of count three? Specifically, in order to constitute tampering, does the defendant need to have physically altered, destroyed, concealed, or removed an item or thing, i.e., physical contact? The court is just taking a look at its instructions. While the court is sitting, may I just retrieve my notes from the conference room outside yes. for a moment? Court will hear from counsel because it appears from the instructions that although the phrase used in the <coughs> note by the juror, physical contact does not appear in the instructions. The court will just hear from counsel. Yes, Your Honor. Good afternoon. Um, I think that the short answer to the jury's question is no, uh, because she's charged under an accessorial liability uh, theory with respect to uh, those counts. And so the jury need only find that she intentionally uh, aided, solicited, importuned someone else in their effort to commit the crime of uh, tampering with evidence. That's the law as I understand uh, accessorial liability. So I think the short answer to their question is no. Okay, Sean Orr. 
They have to act with the exact same intent. It's just another way of uh, I, what I think the court should do is, as it suggests, it should reread the um, charge on tampering and then read accessorial liability uh, together. In other words, I think the way the court had read it, it was sort of separate. So if it reads the tampering uh, elements, that instruction, and then accessorial liability with that, it may clarify. Because well, I think the way Your Honor set it up, it's, you have it separate after conspiracy, and if you read those two together, I think it answers the question without any added verbiage. Well, I think that it's not necessary to give the jury more information than they're asking. Mm -hmm. So what the court intends to do is read count three again, indicate that in count three and in count five, they will see the Connecticut General Statute reference to 53A-155A1 and 53A-8A. 53A-8A refers to accessorial liability. That addresses question number two, or concern number two. Concerning uh, number one, again, they're concerned about count three, charged as an accessory. So the court is not going to indicate other than explaining it, uh, that it is accessorial liability that physical contact is needed. If they have a second question about that, the court will entertain a second question. She's charged as an accessory. And the court will ask, does that respond to your question? And if the former person says no, then the court may have to go further. As long as the court it makes clear, though, that, uh, that the party has to act with the same intent. Well, they're not asking about that, counsel. An accessory can be charged just as the principal. That's the short answer. Well, the court will hear counsel on that response if they are not satisfied with the court's explanation. An accessory can be charged just as a principal can be charged. You wish to be heard, counsel? I just repeat uh, what I indicated earlier, Judge, is that they're asking a very specific question about physical contact, and the state of the law, as I understand it, is the answer is no, and I would ask the court to simply instruct them, no, physical contact is not required. Well, do you not think, counsel, that the court should also explain, again, accessorial liability pursuant to how the information charges it? I have no objection to that. I just think that the, the question which is being asked should be answered more directly, because there seems to be some confusion. Well, the exact, the court does not want to go beyond or leave their question short. Accessorial liability does not require physical contact. That's the response. So rather than just say no, accessorial liability does not require physical contact. We can bring the jury out.
The council stipulate, please. Yes, Judge. Yes. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. The court has a copy of the note sent out by the four person on this date, the 29th of February, 2024. And the court will have this marked as court exhibit. Is this five, Madam Clerk? Uh, yes. Court exhibit five. So the court will read uh, the entire note and then answer the questions as they were posed. Your Honor, can we please receive clarification as to the verbiage of count three? Specifically, in order to constitute tampering, does the defendant need to have physically altered, destroyed, concealed, or removed an item or thing, i.e. physical contact? The second inquiry. Further, the information never mentions the term accessory or accessorial liability. Following the juror instructions would lead one to believe having accessorial <laughs> liability is enough to prove a defendant guilty of tampering with physical evidence. Is that the case, or is the section titled Accessorial Liability from page 44 of the jury instructions misleading? So thank you for your note. If you do not have a copy of the information, the court will read the information, count three, and explain what those numbers at the end of that section mean. Count three, tampering with physical evidence, and the aforesaid state's attorney further accuses the defendant, Michelle Traconis, of tampering with physical evidence and charges that on or about the 24th day of May 2019 within the city of Hartford in the area of Albany Avenue, the defendant, Michelle Traconis, believing that a criminal investigation conducted by a law enforcement agency was pending and about to be instituted, and an official proceeding was pending and about to be instituted, did alter, destroy, conceal, and remove a thing with the purpose to impair its availability in that criminal investigation and official proceeding in violation of Section 53A-155A1 and 53A-8 of the Connecticut General Statutes. Now, 53A-155A1 is the substantive offense of tampering with physical evidence. When you see 53A-8A, that is accessorial liability. Wherever you see that statute number, 53A-8A, that indicates accessorial liability. Number two, further, the information never mentions the term accessorial liability or accessory. Following the juror instructions would lead one to believe having accessorial liability is enough to prove a defendant guilty of tampering with physical evidence. Is that the case, or is the section titled accessorial liability from page 44 of the jury instructions misleading? The court believes it has answered that in the first question. The answer is accessorial liability does not require physical contact. If that does not adequately respond to your inquiry, you can send the court out another note. And um, we invite you to just resume your deliberations. Thank you. Stand in a recess. All right.